So you could also figure out what the units are for epsilon. You could figure out the units for epsilon uh, by plugging that in. Let's see um, if you have to look up epsilon. Let's see where we have to look that up. You'll need to do that for your homework. So let's see if we can find epsilon zero. Remember that your constants are on your inside front cover. Inside front cover, good. Let's see, where's epsilon zero? All your constants are at the top of that page. Um, and it also gives us the number, 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. And you can see this is called the permittivity constant. Okay. Good. I think we talked last week about how, unfortunately, in your textbook, they forgot to put in K in that inside cover. So you might want to uh, put that in your inside front cover, um, what K is from the book. We saw that was about 9 times 10 to the ninth plus some complicated units. Now, it turns out that epsilon 0 and K are used in very similar situations. In fact, yeah. Um, they, they basically are um, indicating the same kind of thing. So there's a relationship between epsilon zero and k. Epsilon zero times k equals one over four pi. That's a good thing to have in your notes. So anytime you have a formula with epsilon zero, it's easy to get rid of the epsilon zero and replace it with k. And anytime you have a formula with k, it's easy to get rid of that and replace it with epsilon zero. In fact, let's solve this for k. What is k in terms of epsilon zero? Um, one over four pi epsilon zero. So we could take this formula that we learned about last week. and rewrite it in terms of epsilon zero. This was the form of Coulomb's law for point source charges and for electric field. We could get rid of the k and replace it with one over four pi epsilon zero, and these are two equivalent formulas. Okay. I think there was one or two questions in the homework last week actually where you had to use this formula instead of this formula. So you can see epsilon zero and k are pretty much interchangeable, and they appear in the same formulas. It's just, I think, a historical accident that uh, physicists came up with two different constants that kind of have the same information in them. So we use whichever one is convenient for the problem that we're working on. We can use this idea. Anytime we need to solve for one of the variables and replace it, we can just go back to here. So k is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. And by the same token, epsilon 0 is 1 over 4 pi k. Last week we made a little flow chart. We said that source charges create electric fields, and then electric fields create forces on test charges. And then we said that this flow chart basically has two parts. You have to know how to go from source charge to field, and you have to know how to go from field to force. So for example, we talked about how to figure out the direction of the electric field based on the source charge. And we also talked about how to figure out the direction of the force based on the field. That would go over this arrow. And we also talked about how to find magnitudes. There's one formula for figuring out the magnitude of the electric field from the source charge. And there's a different formula for figuring out the magnitude of the force from the field. I think that's really a very important uh, flow chart, so I made that into a handout. Oh, All right, so here we have the electric field force handout. Whoops. Uh, so the point here is that here's the three key concepts. Source charge on the left, electric field in the middle, and the force on the test charge on the right. Mm -hmm. And then on top and below each arrow, we show the relevant uh, information. For example, here on the left-hand side, we have the arrow between the source charge and the field. Well, on top of the arrows, I, I wrote down how to figure out the directions. Uh, and then here on the right, I have how to figure out the directions between field and force. And then below the arrows, we have how to figure out the magnitudes. Well, this here on the right, this formula relates the magnitude of the force in the field. And this re relates the magnitude of the source charge in the field. Uh -huh. So these parts on the top part of the handout is what we've talked about so far. Yeah. I already mentioned this formula a couple seconds ago. So this is the formula that relates the field and the source charge. 
But remember we talked last time about how this is just for point sources. This is for point charges. And as usual, I like to use a dot to show that these formulas are just based on magnitudes. Um, remember that we're just using kind of our common sense rules for figuring out the directions. So up here on the flow chart, I put how to find the directions. This just gives us the magnitude. Well, it's not really satisfying to only be able to work with point charges. We'd like to be able to work with more interesting shapes, like spheres or lines or whatever. Well, it turns out that you can use um, our Gauss's law. Here again is Gauss's law. We can use Gauss's law here to figure out the electric field for more interesting conformations. Let's see, I guess before we can get into that, I have to say one more thing here about the electric flux. When we were looking at these formulas for the electric flux, we, we were kind of assuming that you, you use this formula when the electric field is constant. This is all along assuming a constant electric field. Because if the electric field isn't constant, you wouldn't know what E to plug in over here. Only if E is the same everywhere would you know what E to plug in. However, there's many cases when the electric field is not constant. So we need to figure out how to generalize this formula for a non-constant electric field. How can we generalize this formula for a non-constant electric field? And for this, we're going to have to use some calculus. And this is where, at the point in the course where calculus starts to be more important. So how can we generalize this for a non-constant electric field? Well, the first thing is we're going to have to use more differentials, like you learned about in calculus. Oftentimes in calculus, we use symbols like d sub dx or dy. What do these symbols mean? Well, unfortunately, what they mean is a little bit confusing or complicated. It's a, a little bit depends on the context. But what this basically means is a small change in x or a small amount of x. And then one more idea, oftentimes these differentials are only approximate. So oftentimes this would tell us the approximate change in x, or the approximate amount of x. Okay, and you're gonna have to, we just have to use our context a little bit to see sometimes these will represent just the small amount, but sometimes they'll represent an approximate small amount. The most general definition is an approximate small change or an approximate small amount, but sometimes the approximation turns out to be exact. Um, but in general, these gives us approximations. Okay. Let's see how we can use that here. Instead of trying to figure out the flux through the entire area, let's break up the area into a bunch of tiny little patches, a bunch of little tiny little small areas. Well, what would be a good symbol for a tiny little small area? dA. A good symbol for a tiny little small area would be dA, because we know this needs a small amount of area. Well, if the area is very small, then the electric field would be approximately constant over it. Um, we know we're, now we're considering a case where the electric field is changing, but if the area is very small, then the electric field should be approximately constant over it. At least, if we pick a small enough area, eventually it should be so small that there's almost no room, so to speak, for the electric field to change. Yeah. And that would tell us the small amount of electric flux that is escaping from that small amount of area. Mm -hmm. And this is where, where this symbol would now only be approximate. This is only approximate because the electric field isn't literally constant over this small area, it's just approximately constant. So if we take a small area, the electric field will be approximately constant over that area, and then we can use this formula to figure out the approximate small amount of electric flux that's escaping from there. Well, this is a trick we're going to use a lot of times for the rest of the course, so it's important to see what we did here. You take a formula that depends on one of the variables being constant, and if the variable isn't constant, you focus on just a small, a small amount of the other variable, where this variable is approximately constant. And that'll give you the approximate small amount of the dependent variable. Well, now, the logical thing to do, how are we going to find the total amount of flux? Well, what we do is we integrate all these small amounts of flux. And this is a symbol you saw when you took calculus, this integral symbol. But what does this integral symbol mean? Well, the integral symbol actually tells you to do two things. One thing the integral symbol tells you to do is add up. This tells us to find the total flux, add up all these small amounts of flux. 
So this is actually supposed to be an elongated S. You can see how the integral symbol kind of looks like an elongated S, because part of what it stands for is sum. So we're just summing up. Um, this is kind of logical. To figure out the total flux, you add up all these little pieces. 